So hello everyone. I'm Ellie Shore and welcome to Art Salon. There are two guys, these two guys, who have dreamed a very big dream about building an art scene in Palm Beach County. And they took on a huge task because Palm Beach County is an enormous place. And actually there are many art scenes sprinkled around the county. And they put their heads together and said, what would happen if we got people from all of these different parts of the county talking to each other and we created something really special to put Palm Beach County Arts on the map. And they proceeded to do just that. And that is Art Synergy. Craig McInnes and Rolando Chang Barrero were the initiators of Art Synergy. And last year there were six art districts throughout the county and they coordinated with the founders of Art Palm Beach, David and Leanne Lester, who have been just amazingly excited, cooperative, enthusiastic, and in every way supportive. And they're gonna tell you about the process and their plans for this year. This year there will be eight districts throughout this county and they're amazing. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. How y'all doing tonight? Good. Good to see you. So many familiar faces. Uh, yes, we are going to talk about Art Synergy. We're also going to take this opportunity to talk about our careers individually because um, as you will probably see, just due to the nature of the way we've operated coming out of art school all the way up to yesterday has basically led us to thinking of, even thinking of things like Art Synergy. So we're gonna do a, a quick little presentation of our careers as they exist right now and probably where they're headed. And then we'll get into Art Synergy in the, in the uh, second half of the presentation. So I'm gonna, it starts off with Rolando's work. So I'm gonna introduce my business partner here for Art Synergy. This is Rolando Barrero. Take it away, my friend. Thank you. My name is Rolando Chang Barrero. I am uh, the person who kind of revived the arts district in Boynton Beach. There was an arts district there. It was named the Neighborhood Arts District. And I moved into this area, I guess like three and a half years ago. Many of you are probably wondering, and I talked about, to Trina about this, we had a good laugh about it, why I celebrated a four year anniversary in the arts district, uh, if I've only been here three and a half years. Well, one newspaper wrote it by mistake, and the other one copied it, and the other one copied it, and I was like, well, if they're calling it the fourth anniversary, we might as well ha have the fourth anniversary. <laughs> um, I wasn't gonna argue because the, the, the press was tape picking it up, you know? So that's kind of um, how I run everything in my life. Tongue in cheek, and I don't take it too serious. I'm very serious, very focused about how I go about things, but I don't take stumbling blocks, things, roadblocks or anything, all that serious. I just keep going. I don't put too much stake in organizational help, city helping me, county helping me, another organization helping me. I'm very happy and very grateful when they do. But in spite of all of that, I'm gonna keep going. My career started uh, very young. I think I was a little kid and I, and I started taking like painting classes with this old man who used to have a storefront in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And my mom and my dad put me there for about an hour every Saturday. A little bit more to keep me out of the neighborhood and hanging around with the kids than anything else. But I really enjoyed it. And I always drew, I always looked forward to art classes and stuff like that. I ended up having a rough high school. As you can imagine, I was a little ungovernable at the time. And I still am. Uh, <laughs> but I took two years off between high school and college to, to goof off and do whatever it is that I wanted to do. I started designing clothes, I started doing graphics for a major t-shirt company, Michael T-Shirts, which is also known as Diamond Dust, I don't know if anybody remembers. I was uh, a little precocious, I had green hair, mohawk, um, I, instead of wearing flip-flops I was barefoot most of the time. And if I wore much, it was a pair of overalls. And that was it for those two years. And suddenly, I don't know how I ended up working in Bell Harbor, and they hired me because of the window displays and all that stuff. Pretty much, I had the Midas touch. Anything I touched, anything I went after, I got. 
I worked for it, but I got it. That's one thing that I always tell the kids every time I speak to kids. You know, dream big. It's not out of this world. Dream really big and get really big, because you can do it. It's gonna cost you a lot of hardship, and it's gonna, you have to work really hard. I am no different than anybody else. The only thing different may be that I might work a little bit harder and try a little bit more. And Art Synergy was the same thing. My career had flopped and everything because I, uh, I dealt with brain cancer after a whole, had a pretty successful couple of years after college. After graduated, I got the Ryerson Fellowship. I traveled all through Europe, all through Latin America and everything like that. Uh, and then I got cancer and my life kind of fell apart. Um, then I dealt with addictions, alcoholism, and everything as a result of all that. I hit really bad bottoms, and I lost hope. And about four years ago, actually five years ago, I decided to give it a go again. And I was still living in South Beach, and I was looking for a space, and I had originally been in South Beach when it was 50 cents a square foot, and helped organize the South Florida Art Center with Ellie Schneiderman. I don't know if anybody knows who Ellie Schneiderman is. Me, Carlos Alves, there was a group of us that we actually had to kick the tumbleweeds out of the doorways on a regular basis to get in because there were still, I, no, the city wouldn't clean the area. And we built it. We built the arts district there, the South Florida Art Center. We opened up the studios. We ended up being about 20 artists strong. Eventually the shops moved in and they pushed us out. And unfortunately I got news this month that the South Florida Art Center has been sold. So their last property has been sold and they're no longer. So that ends in era. Between that time I went to Chicago and the same thing, a group of us moved in together. We moved into Pilsen, which is now a thriving, the Pilsen Arts District is thriving. When I got there, we were living in a group of us, were 15 of us living in a dog biscuit factory and we turned that into a, a mini art center. So it only made sense that, that I would come here and trying to make a go out of it, I would eventually fall into the same routine of trying to build a community around me, which is what I was used to. I'm not used to working alone. So I rented a 300 square foot space, a little tiny warehouse. Then I rented another one and leased that out to a friend. And, then, and now we have the Boynton Beach Arts District. My work has changed over the years. I was very militant, very angry. I grew up during the AIDS crisis, and I was in Chicago during that time. Harold Washington was found dead. I was found in, in lingerie. They, you know, the whole commotion with the black community and the art community was at odds with each other. Andre Serrano decided to piss in a cup and put a crucifix in it. A couple other people decided to burn flags. Mapplethorpe decided that he wanted to show penises instead of flowers. You know, and all that stuff was going on. The NEA was up in arms. The money was lost. We were fighting. It was a real vibrant time. Performance art was at its peak. And then the AIDS crisis happened. And then all these people started just dying. And more people died and more people died. And I uh, just started doing a lot of reactionary work. That's where I got my nickname, Activista Artista. Um, the Spanish community over there knew me as an activist and my work was dealing with activism. I did a lot of stickering, what they call slaps now, that said fund a mental, support homophobia, bigotry, racism, and it had a picture of Jesse Helms on it. I actually ran a Jesse Helms re-election campaign in Chicago, which was, a, had <laughs> people, people actually thought it was for real. <laughs> they throw tomatoes at me. They, 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 you know, they, they, you know, they tried running me over. They, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. But this, this is actually in a, in a city where you have uh, African American skinheads. You know, so you see everything in Chicago. It was a great time. I loved college. I loved college so much that I wouldn't finish my English requirement, so they wouldn't graduate me. So I had to stay, and I took every studio class that I could. <laughs> So there you go. And I taught in Oxbow, which is in uh, Saugatuck, through a teaching program that they have. I went to Penland School of the Arts also as a visiting artist, teaching with them. So I got to study clay, glass blowing, metal smithing, silver smithing. I got to do everything. And I always tell everybody, you can be a painter. If you want to be a painter, you could be an artist who paints. Okay? And there's a big difference in there.
was to me that your medium is your vocabulary. And you increase your vocabulary as the years go by by learning how to use different media. You can't express everything that you want to with one media. Even if you're not a master of all the media, learn about how to use different things. We were just talking about framing photography and turning it into three-dimensional. If you didn't know woodworking, you didn't know how to do a basic carpentry, you couldn't build something 3D with your photographs. You know, you need to learn all, all the crafts that you can to support your art. Who I am is artist. What I do is make art. What I do doesn't define me who I am. It's my being. I wake up, I eat, I sleep as an artist. Whether I'm sitting in a boardroom discussing it, whether I'm here talking about it, whether I'm in my gallery putting it together, whether I'm in my studio painting, I'm always artist. And Jacques Dubuffet asked me one time, what do you tell a kid who's struggling and he thinks he can't do it? I said, quit. And he looked at me shocked. Said, it's not an easy job. And it's a full-time career. It's a full-time job. And you've got to be vested in it. And if you're 17, 18, and you're in college, and you're already complaining, quit. Right. <laughs> it's not going to get any better. <laughs> The initiative is Art Synergy, which we're here to speak about. Nan uh, Rundy wrote this, which was a real big gift for me. I have a solo exhibition going on at the Florida Atlantic University in Jupiter at the MacArthur Library there. And she surprised me when she said, um, somebody's going to write an essay. I didn't know that she was going to get an art historian to write the essay. And it's like the second essay that's ever been written about me. Uh, the first one was when I was in college. <laughs> And Nancy Forrest Brown included me in one of her books uh, on activism in art. And it's been 30, I think 20 so much years, almost 30 years since somebody else has written anything. And I was very, very honored that this occurred to me. And I'll give you a few minutes to read it if you like. And it's included in a book that they publish for every exhibition that they do. They actually don't do catalogs anymore. They publish books, hardcover books, and stuff like that. So, uh, and it was all paid for, so I, I'm <coughs> very grateful for that. This is the, what I do. <laughs> I run a studio called Activista Artista Studio. I had Activista Artista Gallery, which was a incubator space for emerging artists. And I have since closed that in order to open up a fine art gallery in Lake Worth, which is actually the grand opening is this Friday at 7 o'clock. And I've been working 17 days since I got the keys to put it together. So I am a little tired today. I asked everybody what I should call it, and they said, put your name on it. And I am still the organizer, the director, and the promoter of the Boynton Beach Arts District. I have 11 spaces that I manage. Seven of them which have practicing artists, professional artists in them. I do a lot, a lot of marketing, a lot, a lot of promotion. We include dance, film, video, uh, everything. You name it, it happens at the art walks in one form or another. We've had belly dancers, we've had circus acts. Every, every art form that there is where people are excelling in this area, they get the opportunity to show. Some of you have exhibited there, and I've always been very grateful of the support that I've received there. The Florida Arts Association is the parent company who is still waiting on the 501c3. It's the parent organization that covers all, all the pro projects that the Boynton Beach Arts District does. The Boynton Beach Arts District is the place. The organization is the Florida Arts Association. Art Synergy is also pending its 501c3. Uh, we have organized this year, and you will get a, notified uh, a little bit later on probably in the season for a little bit more of a fundraiser kind of event so that we could finally get organized as a 501c3. And then we will also be tapping you all for your exp expertises in grant writing. <laughs> Where's the gallery in uh, Lakeport? It's at 711 Lucerne Avenue. And ours are the opposite, 11 to 7. <laughs> Just worked out that way. Just worked out that way. I was not that creative or cute. It just worked out that way. <laughs> okay. Uh, my studio, uh, I do a lot of pajaros. 
and pajaros are birds uh, in Spanish. And the way the birds came out, bird is a slang uh, derogatory in Spanish for gay. And most of my pieces during the onset of all the activist work that I did and the AIDS crisis were signed with a little bird in the corner. And I did not sign my name. Either that or, or it was signed Barbie, depending on what the project was. And then as my friends started dying, I started putting birds, wooden birds, I started cutting them out and making epitaphs of them with their names, the date of birth, and whatever they were known for. And I would hang them on trees so people would see how the numbers were rising. It was my way to, to show in our area the amount of people that were passing away. I took that project when I w left Chicago and I took it back to Lincoln Road. Lincoln Road is covered in birds. They were dying faster than I could make them at one point. You know, I had people helping me make them. Then came Andrew and Andrew blew them all away. And people were so aware that I was doing this project that they returned all the birds that they would find on the street. For months, they were still coming back. And I got all of them back except for one. And she returned it the day of the fundraiser when she whispered into my ear, you know I have one. And I was like, go tell that mother and father there that you kept the bird that was supposed to be representing her dead son. <laughs> this woman started crying. <laughs> I was a real prick. <laughs> Excuse the language. And that's just a, you know, she, brought, she went home and brought the bird back and gave it to him. <laughs> um, but the birds have become my signature uh, image. I, I sell them for nothing, $50 to $100. Uh, for me, it's, it's about branding myself and about people walking home with something that makes them happy today because they put smiles on people. Uh, it's a business card that they could afford, they could take. My other work gets a little bit more expensive. So in order to have my name out there and have them recognize it, I make the little birds. And so my signature's just gotten a little bit bigger. The debutantes, I, um, I'm Cuban, and Cubans deal a lot with uh, ballet, debutantes, and all this stuff. So I was interested in the history of the debutantes and coming of age and bringing women into the forefront of society and trading them for land prostituting them out to other monarchies to create larger land masses during, in Europe during the days and stuff like that. So most of them, uh, you'll see in the image, the debutantes have a dress, the woman is missing, because it's and just like the ballerina, the woman is missing, because it becomes about the show. The legs are dangling, and the shoes, everybody says, oh my god, why are all the shoes red? It's the blood dripping out of the, the woman because there's nothing left of her, because she becomes irrelevant. And, and it's my way to pay homage to a lot of the, you know, the whole scene that they've, and the struggle that, that women have gone through, through ballet, through being dressed up, turned into mannequins and stuff like that. And I have a lot of friends of mine that deal with issues like that. I have a lot of lesbian friends, have a lot of feminist friends. And it was an idea I don't talk about very much about why I do things. But most of my work is very loaded with symbolism and imagery. The flags, once again, uh, I did a series of flags and removed the stars and put in the birds. The first piece was called Las Colonias. And there was actually 50, 63 birds on it, signifying the 50 states. 13 of them were orange, uh, which were the first 13 colonies. The other 13 were white or black, depending on whether they were emancipated possessions or they weren't emancipated possessions. It gets a little heady, it gets a little history, but I know it and it, it, it entertains me when I'm doing it. Most people just look at it and go, wow, what a cool flag, it's got little birds on it. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> but uh, all my stuff is pretty heady and loaded with, with stuff, but you know. The Sacred Hearts, again, I removed the crown of thorns and incorporated birds instead of the crown of thorns because of the struggle that people go through and stuff, and I didn't want to make it so Christian, and, I got, and by taking the crown off of it, I removed the whole loaded Christianity thing and made it more accessible for people. Self-portraits, somebody asked me, what, you know, somebody didn't ask me. They came and criticized because I was selling a lot of birds and I put little red dots and put sold on Facebook. 
And he goes like, this, yeah, of course, because you make happy art. That's why it sells. You know, and I was like, oh my God. You know, I did self-portraits for years. Well, as soon as I was able to move my hands, I started moving and making self-portraits. They were horrible. They were sad, dark eyes, lopsided head. My head, as you see, is not necessarily round. It's still, it was even more dented before I got the, the halo put in. So I did a lot of that. A lot of what they call healing, I guess, art. A lot of looking at myself, feeling sorry for myself, documenting my sadness. Not one of those pieces sold. Okay, people all looked at it and went, wow, how interesting, wow, how deep, you know, but I was going broke. <laughs> so I had to stop that. <laughs> this, is, um, this is 20 birds, the 20 top endangered species in the state of Florida. Each bird represents and has the name uh, allocated, starting from the top, going right and, and consecutively down, number one, number two, number three, ending in number 20, the 20 top birds at risk in this state of extinction. And it is being shown now, well, it will be shown at the Endangered Exhibition uh, that benefits the Ape Art for Apes uh, organization. The exhibition is going to be held in Wynwood during Art Basel. Not at Art Basel in Wynwood. <laughs> I have no problem saying it's in Wynwood. <laughs> um, last year I was at Scope. How many people were at Scope last year? How many people got scammed by see me and got, got into Scope like that? I, uh, I paid $75 to be in Scope. I was in Scope and all this stuff. I went in. It was an empty booth with a monitor, nobody there, and I had to wait 10 hours before I realized that there was a million slides there that were yeah. flashing, and by the time they cycled to me, I, I, the show was over. <laughs> <laughs> Elena Toby Singer sent out the art call again for them, and then I, 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 I'm the one that rebutted, you know, and then everybody started rebutting. Um, See Me is a good project, but it's also money maker, and, and that's one of their money making things. So. <laughs> I, I tell it like it is. <laughs> you know, I, I got duped. <laughs> I wanted to be a scope. <laughs> you were. <laughs> I, I was able to say I was, but this is a, a sneak peek into my studio. It's crazy. I have the debutante dresses there. I've been looking at Picasso's work a lot, Paul Clay's work a lot, uh, Miro's work a lot. I'm doing a lot, a lot of study seeing how they balanced images, how they, they work, and seeing how it coordinates with my work. Because those are the three artists that I have been associated with a number of times, and I really didn't think that I was associated with them. I always thought that I was pretty much influenced by Jean Dugoffet, which is the, the person that I, that I mostly studied in, in college. But nobody, nobody compares me to him, which is a good thing. The flag in the back is called uh, Gay-American making a kind of a discussion about who, who are we as a hyphenated uh, society, the Cuban-American, the African-American, the this-American, the that-American, and the whole conversation now whether gay is a culture. And if gay is a culture, then are we gay Americans? And I question that. I don't have a, an answer about it. I haven't come to a decision about that. But the whole painting, uh, that's what it questions. In the back, you'll see the, the darker dresses which are with the crows, and uh, I'm not going to say who influenced those crows. <laughs> I'm not going to say it too loud because Carol is here. <laughs> this is um, the one piece that uh, is now in the collection of Jerry Letrento, who's the vice president of Bank United. And this is called Las Colonias. It's a 48 by 48 piece. And that's the one that I spoke of that has the 63 birds. That's uh, an image of the Sacred Hearts. These are some of the earlier works that I was doing as a, uh, in Chicago in response to the AIDS crisis. The other, this top left one is called Morbid Morbidity, and it deals about how many people here, you know, you don't have to raise your hand, uh, <laughs> masturbate or, or have sexual <laughs> fantasies. <laughs> So we won't, we won't necessarily, but you know, it's, it, it's a real thing. And what happens with the, the morbidness that the people that you're fantasizing about 
that were alive yesterday are dead today. Now you're fantasizing in bed about a dead person. So it gets morbid. And you're running that, uh, am I, you know, I'm, I'm conflicted here now. You know, am I still sexualizing a dead person? You know, and you can't help it because everybody you know was dead. So that was how I dealt with that. This one is called Till the Cows Come Home, which dealt with us not disappearing, the activists not disappearing, uh, until we got everything settled. Oh my, is Jesse Helms in the, in the Garden of Adam and Steve. Uh, <laughs> and then up there is um, called The Evolution of an Artist. So you see how those portraits never really sold? <laughs> <laughs> I'm opening up a fine art gallery in Lake Worth. The grand opening is on the 21st. Uh, it has to deal with lifestyle accessories, uh, everything from wallpaper to, to pillowcases and everything uh, can be available and ordered. A lot of the visual artists who are going into the decorative arts uh, will be shown there, as well as jewelers, sculptors, photographers, um, there's a couple of you people in this room that I have the honor of, of exhibiting your work there. I'm very privileged to be in an area where there's such rich pool of people to pull from. And you're all invited to come by, check out the gallery, and if you want to come to the opening, it starts at 7 o'clock and it's Friday evening. And that takes us back to Boynton Beach Arts District and the Arts District. It pays to be the big fish in the smallest pond. And I keep telling everybody, it's a good thing, okay? Big fish, small pond, got us best exhibition. Big fish, small pond <laughs> also got us best art walk. The Bay Gates project happened as an answer and a reaction to not being able to get signage by the city. Uh, we asked for signage and directional signage, those brown signs on the highway, the street signs, this, that, uh, da, 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 da. we asked for it, they didn't give it to us, we started painting murals. And then we asked for forgiveness and Debbie Coles Dobe was so kind enough to change the law for us. Because uh, <laughs> we were at it already. Uh, Debbie Coles Dobe has been a godsend for me. She's the public arts administrator for the city of Boynton Beach and she has done so much for the city as, and for me personally, as, as heading of the Arts District, she's been my consultant, she's been a friend, everything. And I can't speak any higher of her. She's organizing the second annual International Kinetic Art Exhibit. Some of the pieces are already up on the concrete platforms outside in the Avenue of the Arts Walk. Uh, Lena Toby Singer, uh, Public Arts Administrator for the county, has a big piece there. She's been working all kinds of hours putting it together and asking donations from people. And she has boxes of stuff that she's tying together. I don't know if anybody knows uh, Lena Toby Singer's work. Got boxes and boxes of donations that people brought. And she's going to drip and hang them all down uh, of one of the big banyan trees for the exhibition. I received a letter of, uh, Congressional Letter of Commendation in the Arts which came as a surprise to me because I build curriculums for students to engage them in coming in and giving them reasons to come in. One of my exhibitions, I brought the students to gather the garbage that we were going to use to recycle and make a project. So we did a whole beach cleanup first. We brought them to meet Tiki Tom, which is an outsider artist working uh, with found objects from the beach. They got to meet him. They got a lesson in what legal walls, what non-legal walls is, what vandalism is, what murals are, the graffiti, street art, and we had representatives of all the different types of aesthetics that work outdoors to teach the kids. And then we had Stephanie Lee, which is a upcycler artist that deals with album covers and stuff like that, making purses and bags. And the kids got engaged and the teacher was ecstatic and she actually wrote Elsie Hastings a letter about it. And Elsie Hastings sent me a letter, which it took me four weeks to open, because <laughs> that, during that time was the flood, the great flood, the great rain, that we almost lost the arts district. <laughs> studio availability, I make studios available, community project sites. If you have a project that you want to do there, call. We don't charge. You may have to pay for the permit fee. We, give, we put concerts together. We put festivals together there. We hold fundraisers, 
we've had about four or five different fundraisers there for different reasons. We have had animals, we've had people with cancer. Uh, we had one gentleman who had a motorcycle accident that was a patron, and he was taking care of his father, or his elderly father, and that was enough reason to have a fundraiser, because he was an art patron. So we like our artists as much as our patrons. <laughs> Dance, music, performance art, and everything in between, we've shown and, and done there. The Florida Arts Association is a not-for-profit umbrella organization, and it's waiting for its 501c3. The publications that you will find me in include, or, or the Arts District mentioned of note, is Art and Culture, Details Magazine, which is a New York-based fashion magazine, Delray Beach Magazine, Boca Magazine, Art Hive, been in every newspaper because of the Arts District, and uh, sometimes actually because of my work. Much less frequently, <laughs> much less frequently, but <laughs> I just got published Mi Pajaro with the MacArthur Library, how I said, and The Subversive Imagination by Carol Becker in 1991, and that was with Nancy Forrest Brown. Films, I have two uh, films that are included. I, my graduate program was in film and media. Back then it was called Time Arts because it was the performance days, so everything was called funny names. I have a three minute black and white in camera edit, that means there's no editing, called El Pajaro, and another one called La Fruta, which are now in the private collections inside the New York Public Library, and that, I think, wraps it up for me. And now I'm going to give you my dynamic partner, who makes me laugh, and we have a great time organizing everything, because y'all need to have a sense of humor to do as much as we get done. <laughs> That's for certain. He's already done a lifetime worth of stuff in not even half a lifetime, right? <laughs> Kudos. So uh, I will start out by saying that Rolando is one of my mentors. Um, I call him kind of like a big brother and a mentor at the same time because he has had such a diverse career and achieved so many things already and on track to achieve more because of his outlook, because of his lighthearted nature. And, uh, and like you said, he doesn't take things too seriously. After all, this is the creative realm. We should be lighthearted and we should look at everything through rose-colored glasses when possible, and try not to get frustrated by whatever kind of red tape or, or the powers that be that might be not working in the same direction that we want to. So without even realizing it, I kind of followed a similar path to Rolando, a little simpler with a lot less bullet points, but uh, I kept it diverse because I didn't know what I wanted, wanted to be. I knew I wanted to be creative, but I didn't know what realm I was gonna end up in. And so doors, as they do, would open and close, and I pretty much stuck my foot in any door that opened. And uh, I never had any regrets about that. I, I got shot down avenues that I didn't go to school for, had no knowledge of, but enjoyed doing nonetheless. It kept me diverse. It, it, it allowed me to be able to say yes to another project that might have a, had a, a similar kind of feel <coughs> to it, that if I had just stuck to just my schooling, that would have never happened. I would have been one of these deals, okay? If you guys are creatives, you know that you just, you just can't have that. You have to have a 360 degree view and you have to be able to uh, allow yourself to do things that are uncomfortable. If someone asks you if you can do it and you have a one millionth of a percent in your mind that you can, just say yes and you'll figure it out. Uh, so I've done that a bunch of times. So, uh, and that's what's gotten me here. And, it's not, and it's, not, it's not BS to say that. You're a creative, you're going to figure it out, whatever it is, I guarantee this. You're, you've probably proven it numerous times in your own life. Kind of a lengthy artist statement. I, I meant to edit it after I read yours but I didn't edit it. <laughs> Again, my mentor, I'm like, oh, that's so much better than mine. But uh, this, is, this is pretty, you know, this pretty much sums it up. It's kind of heady as well. But for me, it really is about that. Even though I, I, I dance the line between commercial and fine art, very much so, it's still about whether or not it feeds the soul. And if a client rubs me the wrong way for a low, for, on the commercial side of things, I just won't do it. I just won't do it. I'll switch to peanut butter and jellies for a month before I do something that is going to suck the soul out of my body. So, moving, moving on. Okay, our recent achievements. It's been a lot of murals, which is good. <laughs> Look at that. Art at the airport. No, it is. It, it is. And it goes through phases. You know, there'll be a lot of murals, and then there'll be tons of graphic design, and then there'll be tons of, not that those are achievements, but just the way my art career has gone is it just moves in big cycles like that. And it all depends on what time of year it is, depends on where I'm, I'm what fires I'm stoking. I'm presently having recently moved to uh, Northwood and being involved with the Lot 23 program and just being involved with city in general 
in Lake Worth in the West Palm and Boynton areas and knowing some people on CRAs and things like that has just gotten me down that road of doing murals, which I love, love working big like that. So does everyone know about Lot 23? It's an artist live workspace. It's eight apartment units in the uh, neighborhood of Northwood. Everyone know where Northwood is? Okay, good. I urge you to visit there. It is the neighborhood that could. Um, so, <laughs> lot, tw lot 23, <laughs> and is, not only could, is, uh, mural, mural project being part of that, and I'm happy to have just completed, that first picture you saw is of the mural uh, that was completed for the Northwood mural project. Lot 23 is subsidized artists live workspace. They're beautiful units on a nice little piece of land, and we do community service hours in exchange for that subsidized rent. The way it has uh, manifested itself is that we are all teaching artists, so we do uh, programming there in the neighborhood. I teach a drawing class. One of my neighbors teaches dance. Another neighbor teaches African drumming, and so on and so forth, down eight artists, and it's all free to the community. My particular class happens at the Center for Creative Education, which is also there in Northwood. And if you want to know more about the programs themselves, you go to the CCE website, Center for Creative Education, I believe it's cceflorida.org, and you can find out about these classes. They're free and great for all ages. It really depends on what you're trying to achieve and what you're looking for. But great program, very happy to be a part of it, and has really shaped the last year of my life quite well because it's gotten me more down this road of, of teaching, um, which is a road I didn't even realize that I wanted to explore. Uh, recently, did just this weekend, did a cartoon workshop here at the Armory. And I believe that being part of Lot 23 has just kind of, you know, nudged me in that direction. I didn't go running towards teaching. It just kind of, it was just another one of those doors. It opened, and I'm like, I kind of, I kind of am curious. <laughs> a foot in there. And it's worked out. I, I'm actually kind of really loving teaching in all ages, too. I mean, I do like the younger folks because I would like to help to mold them and also help to see if I can thwart uh, any mistakes that I've made, maybe pass it on to them. And what am I doing with my knowledge? Am I trying to leave the earth with all my knowledge? No, I want it all out there for someone else to use, someone more talented than me or, or has more fire to uh, go to another place with whatever knowledge I can give them. So let's move on from the achievements. Publications. Some of this is for much, much the way Rolando's gotten tons of press for Boynton Beach Art District. My, my little caveat into a lot of press has been Fright Nights at the South Florida Fairgrounds, which I'll, I'll touch on a bullet point of some of the stuff I've done. Since I'm the press contact for that, and I'm also in charge of the graphic design and the, and the marketing material and things like that, I end up talking to the press more often than not. And like a true artist, I make sure to mention you know, what I do in my website and da 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 <laughs> So you know, it's an opportunity. I have these people in front of me, even if it's off camera or off the record. I'm still going to let them know who I am and what I do and uh, even be as presumptuous enough as to, if I have my laptop there, oh, check out my, uh, check out my webpage. You know, this is what I do. So uh, I've been blessed to be in these fine publications and always working to try and get in other ones. And that's another place where Rolando is a mentor of mine because he's got so many cool little think nuances that he does with the press to, get, to keep his press momentum. If you haven't seen this guy in the, in the newspaper every week, then you're not reading the newspaper. <laughs> Okay, so these are those doors that I speak of, okay, or, or I call them stepping stones because they all intersect if you were to put these on some kind of timeline and draw lines between them and how they all work together and how they all happened, it would be a big mess because it still happens right now. They're all tied together. So this is what I say when I say I'm dancing between commercial and fine. I'd rather be a fine artist. That's where I get most of my joys in my studio throwing material at various surfaces, but I'm drawn to the commercial stuff as well. I went to school for advertising design. I thought I was going to go to New York and work in an ad, ad agency as a, either as, a, as someone who was knocking out the work or someone who was coming up with the concepts or whatever. You know, that was my high school idea of what kind of artist I wanted to be. And that still runs through me. I quickly found through some internship that I did not want to work at an ad agency, which was good to find out when I was 20. I was like, oh, no, no, no. I think this stinks. I'm going to go do murals instead. No one's, no one's yapping at me. I get to throw paint. Granted, it is you know, of an English garden, which is not my preferred subject matter, but, <laughs> but yeah, murals serve me well. So I mean, that's why they're there, and they still serve me well. Um, but yeah, so commercial and fine, it's a tough place to be sometimes. I would never complain, but uh, I'm always working to try to get more towards that fine edge of things, because at this present time, paint is my favorite medium, so that, that's where I would like to be, uh, hoping to move towards 3D and things like that and, and the fine end of things. So. I was a touring musician because I did that typical thing, getting out of uh, art school and quickly 
ignoring my degree and frightening my parents by going, I'm going on tour with a band. Like, well, you just got a degree, you fool. So I did that for, I did that for five years. Uh, chased a deal. That was during the 90s when deals, uh, record deals were actually available, you know? So we did that for a while uh, without any, re any regrets. I'm still, still a singer, um, still a songwriter, still have a band, just not trying to get a record deal, just doing it because it's just another output that I have to do. There's just no way I can't make music. There's instruments strewn about my apartment and they, they, they get picked up on a daily basis. They need to be. Prop design and building of props is, is a great thing that happened by accident. I started working for event production companies that do corporate social type of work, anniversaries, bar mitzvahs, uh, if Target's throwing a banquet, that type of thing, and they need a giant Target logo or they need a, you know, you need little table toppers. So I started doing that just by accident, again. Ran into a friend of a friend. I thought, oh, you know, man, I, thought, I think your skill set would be good for this. There's a lot of cutting and building and gluing and, and designing. So I got to go down that road and I still work for two different event companies one in Pompano and one here in West Palm. You might be familiar with Creations. They've been around for a lot of years. They do most of Trump's work. So lucky to be down that road. Graphic design, that's, uh, I often say that as I was leaving art school, as I was walking out the front door, they were wheeling the Macintosh computers in the back door. I completely missed the cut right there. I had to learn graphics on my own out in the world, which was fine, because it was a lot more practical, I imagine, than, than trying to learn it all in school. But I was a caveman. I was a caveman in a spaceship at that point. But uh, over the years, I've gotten used to it and, f and found my place as a graphic designer. Art Institute is where I went, and it served me well in a lot of other ways, mostly thinking, mostly in the head. Set design happens at um, the event companies, also happens at, at Fright Nights uh, at, the, at the Haunted House. FX makeup came because of Fright Nights. I was just there. I was helping out friends, just being a scare actor, just jumping out of the dark you know, and scaring folks. And then I realized I didn't like the makeup artist. Like she had like a certain attitude that I didn't want to deal with, so I started doing my own makeup. And then some of my cast members, co-cast members are like, who did your makeup? I did it, oh, you do mine. And then I started doing this little group of people, which of course made the makeup artist very happy. <laughs> it increased her crappy attitude tenfold. <laughs> uh, but I didn't care, I was like, I'm having fun. So, and that just led me down that road. Now I, now I, um, I still do a bunch of faces each year, and I still, do, I still do my own makeup, of course, when it comes to that. <laughs> Uh, character and concept design, that's Fright Nights as well. So I'm lucky to do that. that. That leads me hopefully towards more in the film industry because I got a couple friends who are directors and I was lucky enough to do a storyboard art for a, a feature film this past year that is about to, I believe, be on HBO first. And it's, go, it's entering all the uh, major film festivals. So happy to be a part of that. Did Apprentice as a tattoo artist. Gave it a good old year and a half for me to realize it wasn't for me. It was a cool trip. That is a skill, I mean. It, it still has a negative connotation in a lot of realms, but it's art. Uh, it, most of those people are also fine painters or at least illustrators or something. It's, uh, so a lot of my friends urge me to do that because I have bold lines and things like that in my work. And they're like, oh, that'd make a great tattoo. Most of your stuff would make a great tattoo. Why don't you do it? Because I'm not you know, sitting in a shop all that time and then, you know, then, you know blood. I mean, come on. It's <laughs> fucking obvious. <laughs> so I was just... I didn't freak myself out over that because, you know, you're gloved up and you wear a mask and everything's sterile, but at some point it just gets funky. I'm like, why, why? It was like I could just go on a piece of wood or a canvas or something. <laughs> a wall. And a whining and moaning. The canvas never whines and moans, no matter how much I jab. That's great. Teaching, teaching happened, uh, again, because of, mostly because of Lot 23. And uh, art advocacy is something I'm still learning. Uh, exactly what it is and what it means and how much dedication it takes, mostly through this gentleman, also through Trina Burks and a few other people that I consider to be mentors and people that have done big moves on a medium size or small scene, whatever, however you look at this scene. Anyone who can do that, you know, is someone that I look up to and someone that I, that I want to learn from. So that's where we are. Creative director for Fright Nights at the South Florida Fairgrounds. That's a great story for any young artist that I try to tell them because I started, I literally started as an actor and now I'm pretty much in control of all the creative of it, which is exactly where I am. I'm not in charge of the operation, which I would never want to be, ticketing and security and blah, blah, blah. No, all the creative edge. So I, I just carved my own little niche. I was an actor, then I was makeup, then I was set design, then I, had, I designed a haunted house, then I took over all three haunted houses, and then I took over the branding and the t-shirts and the this and the that and the this. So, great story. Still happening today. Uh, some of my work. Baba. Baba. Uh, my late grandfather was a musician. That's where I got some of my music blood. 
Also on my grandmother's side, everyone played some kind of instrument. Uh, I still have that horn, that's the best thing. That's like one of the only things I have. I have that horn and this picture that I painted it from. So those are the two things I have from my grandfather. So I'm like, why have I not painted this yet? So in need of some new work last year, leading up to Art Palm Beach, leading up to Continuum in West Palm Beach, this was created. A fun one to do. A good representation of my style. Showed this at uh, Continuum last year. This is quite a large piece, a statement piece. It goes pretty deep down the well, but the bullet points are heaven and hell, life and death. It's called Ascension, so it's, you know, it's about striving and trying to achieve what you need to achieve. I couldn't delve deeper into my mind to tell you why it was created. It was actually a, a line drawing that I had for a life and death concept. The bird was in existence on a piece of paper as a line drawing. A lot of my stuff starts like that because I come from a cartoon background. The reason I'm an artist now is because of Garfield and Snoopy and all that. You know, I just got, I got addicted to those simple, bold little things that were so effective. And uh, you know, it's still, a lot of my stuff starts that way. Again, it might start on a napkin. This is a good example of that. It was actually a tattoo design, typical, for someone who wanted it and never came to get it. And I was like, okay, that's cool. I'll turn it into a painting, thank you. Oh, this guy. He's, uh, he's up for consideration for the Endangered Show. He's in the batting circle. We'll see if he makes the cut. If they have room, it's kinda. So uh, the fact that he's only 20 by 20 is, is uh, in my favor. <laughs> I like it, but he's real small. You just jam him in a corner. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. He's up for consideration. Right now he graces my living room, which is absolutely awesome. This is the band I'm in now. I just put a couple in here, a couple offshoots like this, because it is an important part of my makeup because the two things do tie together. Music influences my art, art influences my music. So uh, it's just part of my fiber, always will be. We were blessed enough to play Sunfest this year. It's the second time we've played it. We're a five piece band. Um, all family men or career men, and uh, it's a relaxed thing. It's just, um, and I think that's why things like Sunfest happen, because we just relax into it. When we were scratching and clawing to get a deal in the 90s, I swear I stood in every major label office and hocked our demo and all that, and nothing came of it. And I think it's because we were scratching and clawing. Uh, this is me, me and my freaks at Fright Nights. This is just a end of the night kind of pep talk. I wish they were more in focus. It's kind of a cool shot, though, because of the rack focus, but cast of 110 people that, um, that I manage through an awesome team of levels of management, actor coordinator, operations manager and stuff. At first I was like, how do I do this? But again, like I said to you guys before, if someone asks you, can you be the creative director for, for a haunted event and you're that kind of person, you like darker art and you're that, you just say yes. I didn't know how the heck I was gonna pull this off. I had absolutely no idea until we, st we stood in there the first day and we're like, all right, man, ready? Let's fake it. <laughs> fake it for a couple weeks, and then all of a sudden, that became a protocol, and that became a program, and now this thing runs like a well-oiled machine. That was years ago, that was seven, that was eight years ago now. Now we have a system, and it works like a charm. That's true of anything. Uh, so here, uh -huh. we're hamming it up in front of uh, a wall that I did at the Boynton Beach Art District, which if any of you do murals, and you have the opportunity to, to participate in any of the mural, uh, programs that he has, whether it be the Bay Gates, or this was for, was this for Bay Gates? Um, this was for the... Paint It. The, the second anniversary, which was called Paint It. Paint It, okay. Yes. So the, the amount of times that this gorilla has been in the newspaper just because he's there and he's big and all that stuff, is that alone, because he's a press monster, you know, that's, that's what I try to tell kids when they're trying to, to get out there and they want to get noticed and all that. There's many ways to do it. You just jump on the coattails. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but really, more importantly, what happened was I, I came at him as an artist who wanting to participate in Boynton Beach Art District first, and then realized that we had a lot of the same uh, nuances to the way we wanted to do things and the way we achieve things, whether it be that lightheartedness or that straight to the point, black and white, blunt nature that we have, which is good. <laughs> I like doing business like that. I don't like things shrouded in grays and secrecy. So yeah, we just hit it off right off the point. And, and if you find those, those kindred spirits, that's what it's about. That's who you need to, because you've got to do it with a team. Working solo is, uh, is kind of a dead end road. You're only going to get so much done because there's only so many hours and it's you times 24. It's better to have 10 times 24 hours getting work. And that's how our synergy came together. People cut from the same cloth, all on the same path, or at least parts of that same path, and all dedicated to donating a certain portion of their time, of their soul, 
to try to get something moving forward. So that's how this came about. How did it begin? It was a misty morning. <laughs> there was no birds singing. No. <clears throat> It really did start with a goal of unification. So it started with simple conversations with my cohorts, whether we were crying the blues or whether we were actually trying to think of solutions. I don't exactly remember. A lot of the times it is just crying the blues. But then you go, you know what we could do, though? You know, if you don't just stay negative, negative, negative about it, at some point you're going to find a solution if you want to find a solution. So unification, it sounds like a grandiose term, and it sounds like a pipe dream because, again, Palm Beach is a sprawling county. You take, that, take the geography into effect. You take the years and years of politics that are woven into the fabric, which, of which we care nothing for, politics, that, that, those, that's irrelevant. And you take artist ego, you take, you could stack the case against unification easily. And that, that was the problem, that's what we were complaining about, which is why it's exactly what we should go after with fervor to try to make happen. Because the egos need to fall away and the politics are irrelevant. And the geography, well, yeah, you can get over it. We have transportation. So it started with a think tank, okay, getting like-minded people in a room to discuss the problems, not lament and beat to death the problems. The problems are obvious. They're all, they're all coming out of everyone's mouth in different language, but it's basically the same problems that are the same challenges that we found with the art scene. The point of the think tank was to find the solutions and not just have it be a, a complaining festival, okay? If someone started complaining, we would literally shut them down because we're like, everyone's got jobs and kids, we gotta get out of here, so let's get to the solution. Do you have a solution for the thing you're complaining feverishly about? If not, put a sock in it, sorry. And that's the way the think tanks went and, and because we were so, uh, we were like a kitten batting a mouse, eventually the people with thin skin and who only wanted to complain fell away. And that's where the team came from, that's where the leaders came from. It's a good, if you don't have time to waste, it's a good way to do it. I'm sorry. There's, maybe there's someone out there that's got their feathers ruffled the wrong way because of something I said at a think tank meeting. I'm not too concerned about it. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be cold, but we're talking about business. We're, talking about a, we're not talking about a family picnic. So to be black and white and be quick and be blunt and be effective and be efficient was really the main thing, and it still is. The art synergy meetings will run the same way. It doesn't have to be blunt now because everyone's kind of on the same team, but that's how it started. So the people that stepped forward, you, you know, you had... You had Rolando, uh, Lake Worth, uh, Rolando and Boynton. Lake Worth was an obvious choice because they do have an, uh, an art district and, they, and the CRA is, is working hard to try to create a brand there and an actual, and Rolando coming to town will probably help that down the road a little bit. Worth Avenue is an obvious choice uh, that was brought to us by the partnership uh, that we formed with the Lesters. Antique Row, that was, uh, there was a few people from Antique Row that wanted to step up and make something happen. And um, Clematis was kind of an obvious choice, and Northwood was also an obvious choice. You got a lot of art entities there. Leaders, that's a redundant bullet point. The organizational meetings were just that. They were, uh, they were efficient, and they were uh, as organized as they could be, was something that none of us had really ever done before. It was daunting at first, but to have a room full of like-minded individuals, it kind of brought it down to reality and made it seem like it was possible. And we proved that it was. Uh, it was literally just a dozen people in a room trying to work this thing out. Okay, so that led to uh, par the partnership with Art Palm Beach and the American International Fine Art Fair. The Lesters, in other words. That was through a connection with um, one of our leaders. The Northwood leaders were Freddie and Nikki Hennevel of Hennevel's Gallery and Gifts there on Northwood. They had already been in discussions with the Lesters about this very thing, trying to partner up and trying to get a local presence at the international level. As simple, it became as simple as them giving us a booth on the floor of their convention. When I originally was thinking about this and talking about it with Rolando, I said, so here you've got Basil, and you've got Miami looking at Basil like this giant, beautiful, shiny set of coattails. So Miami jumped on the coattails. So here you've got Art Palm Beach, which I would view as the Basil of West Palm Beach, and West Palm Beach is just and we're like, it's puzzling, it's puzzling, but it's great, because that means we can, now we can do it. Now we can do it, great. What if it had started and spun off the tracks? We would have had to steer it back on the tracks. Here we are, we got brand new steering wheel, and it's all ours. So it was a beautiful thing. It just kind of just fell into place. And it happened over a very short period of time. So a lot of things had to be done quickly. 
which is another great challenge because we had to be efficient. We couldn't be, we couldn't be sitting around pontificating about we're going to do this and we're going to do that. It's like, I'm going to need this stuff now, now, by 6 o'clock. So it happened in a very short amount of time. This is a shot of the booth from the International Art Fair, not Art Palm Beach. Uh, so we got booths at both spaces. <clears throat> Lester's very generous with us to allow us to do that. So here is all local art from Palm Beach County amidst all the fine art from all over the globe. And I think one of the artists whose work is there is actually in our audience. Really? <laughs> yes, Colin Walter and three of the people in that picture have done salons mm -hmm. here. <laughs> and probably more will. <laughs> Yep. And you've got the districts represented as well. So it was, a, it was a nice slice of the county. Had to be quickly juried, had to be quickly put together, but it came out beautiful, as shown by this picture. Do you have the same amount of space to still come here, or did you read Did you answer that before when Greg? We're going to have a larger space this year. The same space that we had for Arts Energy last year, we're going to have the same space now as a double booth. At our last Palm year, at our Palm Beach, we were branding and marketing ourselves, so we used half of the space primarily for branding uh, and getting the information out for the people to be able to visit the different art districts. Our goal this year is to once again make sure that the arts districts are shown and highlighted in the district and in the information that we hand out. But the exhibition will be a curated in, in exhibition run through juried art services and it will not necessarily represent every district. It is going to be the best of Palm Beach art. Last year, uh, we had a little trouble with inconsistencies at um, that first show, because some districts, when they sent in the submissions, they kind of sent them in late, and the cutoff is the December 15th. And we didn't have time to, to argue it or fix it, or it was just, yeah. it was literally, we got the word from the Lester's three and a half months before this show hit the floor. So I was like, ah, oh, OK. What are we going to do? We're used we had no protocols. We had no boilerplate. Uh, this is an advertisement from Pure Honey, but it kind of sums up what happened during that, that week. Okay, here, here you have the districts that were represented. Each district had a night, a dedicated night. That was in the marketing material that we put out on the Art Palm Beach floor. That's it in a, in a, in a nutshell. Steve Rollman helped me edit this to make it even more concise because I, I like tried to pour a bunch of information on him. He's like, no one's going to read that, dude. <laughs> Let me edit you. <laughs> the good news this year is that new districts have been added to the initiative. It doesn't mean more days. It means the districts are going to have to clump together to make their night work and represent themselves. But it does mean we are starting to grab more and more of Palm Beach County. As big as it is, I mean, we, there's nine now. It could be 15, honestly. Is there 15 art districts? Maybe there is. There's just little hubs, like Ellie said. There's little hubs of art where you turn a corner and you're like, oh man, I didn't know this. A strip of galleries. So here's the call. Okay, I made it simple because it's a big crazy link if I put it up here and I want you to jot that down. If you go here, it's on the main page. It's on the home page for our website. You'll find a link to Juried Art Services. You have until December 15th. Follow the directions if you want to be considered. <laughs> Trina, I said that for you. <laughs> Trina curates, so sometimes calls get messy because people are like, wait, you wanted me to sign and date it? Yes, yeah, right there where it says signature. <laughs> so artsynergypbc.com is all you really need to remember if you want to participate in the show. You still have time. There's your dates for Art Palm Beach week where we are coinciding with Art Palm Beach. The branding for this year, for next year actually, for the Art Palm Beach Week that you will be hearing will be Art Week 2015. Uh, last year we had Art Alfresco, this, that. We had a lot of different cool names for all our district events. And people started thinking that it was six or seven disenfranchised events. This year, everybody's under the banner of Art Week 2015. So everybody knows that it's a week-long event. There will be pop-up galleries. There will be art district names. There will be neighborhood names. There will be city names. But the big banner of which everything is falling under is Art Synergies Art Week 2015. So keep a lookout for that. Tell a friend. Yes. Tell a friend. <laughs>
<laughs> Someone photoshopped it. Did you do that? I, I didn't do that. I didn't either. Ah. Ellie, Jerry. Jerry. Jerry did it. <laughs> See, I emailed this to him earlier today, and he had plenty of time to Photoshop the mustaches on. I love it. I would have preferred if you had lowered my hairline as well. <laughs> but that's all right. Next time. This concludes our programming, but not the salon. As I said on Facebook, you got to love these guys. <laughs>